So here we're going to start our talks on the environmental and occupational lung diseases. This is part one. Uh, so I have another part uh, that you can watch. Um, we're going to focus primarily here on the environmental lung diseases. Uh, so I would uh, recommend that you watch the other video as well so you get sort of the full gist of the environmental and occupational diseases. I'm going to talk here about smoke inhalation and gastric aspiration and then on the other set we're going to talk about the pneumoconiosis uh, which include co-workers pneumoconiosis, uh, silicosis, and asbestosis which is addressed in its own separate section and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Okay. So, smoke inhalation is going to be really important, especially if you plan on going into the ED, because as many as 30 to 40 percent of burn patients will also have smoke inhalation to a certain degree. And it's going to vary based on whether they were trapped in a burning house or if they stuck their hand in a fire and burnt their arm. You know, so you got to use your noggin here. Not all burn patients are going to have smoke inhalation. And based on the history, that's going to help you determine whether the patient probably has smoke inhalation or not. Uh, so there are some ways, though, that you can clinically uh, discern whether smoke inhalation is likely. So any patient with burns to the lower face and neck is likely to have some degree of smoke inhalation and certainly any burn patient who has a decrease a decreased level of consciousness or uh, low oxygenation those are definitely patients that uh, are uh, they have smoke inhalation until proven otherwise as far as giving them oxygen is in any uh, any emergency situation it's the ABCs so we want to secure an airway Particularly if they have decreased level of consciousness, when in doubt, you're going to intubate. So don't don't uh, don't bother uh, to not err on the side of caution. I mean, if if the if you don't know whether the the patient needs to have a tube or not, if it's in the air, you're going to intubate the patient. Really, the patients you don't need to intubate are the ones that are talking to you. And even uh, those patients in between, smoke inhalation injury progresses even after the injury. So when they're being wheeled in immediately uh, after they've been found, that's not the worst their illness is going to get. So uh, intubation is the best way to fall if you're not sure. There are three major consequences to smoke inhalation, and those are thermal injury, primarily affecting the upper airways, and that's going to be what is going to obstruct your, uh, your, your uh, airways that is going to make you want to intubate. So that thermal injury uh, elicits an inflammation, and that inflammation hasn't, isn't finished yet. So the patient may be able to breathe when, they're, uh, when they present to the ED, but ultimately they may need intubation. Chemical injury is uh, injury to the lung parenchyma, and that's just due to the breathing of, of the chemicals that are in the smoke. So those are like aldehydes and organic acids. Uh, it really just depends on what's burning. It can also include, uh, it can include uh, different nitrates, and uh, it can also include uh, cyanide. And then the result of these two things are impaired tissue oxygenation. In the acute setting, maintaining an airway, which, like I said, is usually intubation, and oxygenation is most important. The best way to decide if a patient needs to be intubated is to look at their oxygenation, and if it's significantly greater than 90, then you can keep them on whatever they're on, whether it's a nasal cannula or a face mask. If you can't get it above 90, then you're going to need to move up in, uh, in, in, in uh, so if you, you have, if you have a nasal cannula, move up to a mask. If you have a mask, then move up to intubation. Now, one thing that's really important here, uh, and I, I actually included it down here, is that you need to get a carboxyhemoglobin level immediately. And the reason you need to do that is because if you just have a pulse oxygen, which is what you usually will have uh, in the emergency setting, uh, which will tell you maybe 85 or 92%, that's not necessarily telling you how oxygenated they are. 
If they have carbon dioxide on their blood, remember carbon dioxide is a competitive inhibitor for oxygen. So if the, uh, the pulse ox will show the carboxyhemoglobin level as well. So it can be falsely high. So you need to have a carboxyhemoglobin level and that percentage, you subtract that from the pulse ox and that will give you your true saturation. So it's going to be really important to get that immediately so you can determine what the patient's true oxygenation level is. Okay, so the history for a patient with smoke inhalation, obviously this is going to be pretty straightforward. Exposure to smoke or a burn patient, the longer they're exposed to smoke, the worse. So the longer they're exposed to smoke, you know that they're going to be breathing in that superheated air longer. They're going to be breathing in those acids and aldehydes, uh, carbon dioxide, and so the longer they're exposed, the worse. Symptoms that we want to pay attention to are di uh, distress or decreased level of consciousness. Those are going to be signs that the patient is deoxygenated, and so th those are patients that are likely going to need immediate intubation. Strider, dyspnea, tachypnea, uh, those are signs of chemical injury to the airway. Um, so I would say that if a patient has significant strider, that is an uh, indication to intubate them as well. Drooling, soot on the skin, burns to the face or neck, those are also signs that the patient has had smoke inhalation. And then wheezing, rails, and ronchi, and oscillation, that shows the, uh, the chemical injury. Okay, so diagnosis is going to be based on suspicion. You should keep a high index of suspicion in any patient who has been in a burn situation or exposed to smoke. You should, as, as mentioned, in, intubate them immediately if their level of consciousness is decreased or if they're unable to maintain 90% saturation level on supplemental oxygen. And you're going to be giving them 100% oxygen. You should, as mentioned, get the carboxyhemoglobin levels so you can determine what their true saturation levels are. Any burn patient is going to need IV fluids, and particularly, you're going to need to be giving IV fluids to patients with smoke inhalation because there can be damage to the, uh, to the alveolar capillary tree, and that can cause a major disruption of the, uh, of the fluid state. So you should be administering IV fluids to any burns patient, and you do that using the Parkland's formula, which I will address uh, in the next slide. Routine labs and a chest x-ray are also good for baseline. But remember, the first step in management is always going to be uh, intubation if necessary because that's part of the ABCs. Then it's going to be administering fluids. Then it's going to be getting your carboxyhemoglobin levels. Um, and then you can go ahead with your routine labs, your chest x-ray, and so forth. In the ED, you're also going to be providing for uh, any other emergency management of burns while they're down there. And of course, you're going to need consultation uh, for admission. You're going to be calling the burn unit if there is one at your hospital, uh, internal medicine or surgery, uh, depending on the extent of the patient's burns. If it's, primarily, uh, if it's primarily smoke inhalation, then you can call internal medicine. If they have a great deal of burns, uh, skin burns, then you're going to need to call surgery. But the burn unit is good either way. And these are patients that generally need to be admitted to the ICU. So the Parkland formula, we use the rule of nines. So just remember the head and the arms are nine. And then your, uh, your trunk is 18, which is two times nine. And your back is 18. And then your leg on the front and on the back is 18 on both legs. So your trunk and each leg are all, this, uh, are all the same. So uh, let me rephrase that. The front of your trunk is 18, which is the same as your entire left leg or your entire right leg. The back of your trunk is 18, which is the same as both legs. So your trunk in total is 36. And then each leg is 18. And then your arm... They're, they're nine because they're smaller than the legs. And then your head is nine too. With kids, it's a little different. Uh, but as far as adults go, you can use this rule of nine. Okay. Uh, and then how do we determine the amount of fluids? Well, we take four milliliters 
multiply that by their burned surface area and multiply that by their weight in kilograms and we get a number and then we take that number and we take half of it and administer that over the first eight hours and then the other half we administer it over the next 16 hours so if for instance you have uh, 5,000 as a as a total here uh, or 6,000 then you're going to divide that in half and then divide that by eight, and that's your uh, that's going to be your uh, your rate of fluid administration per hour. Then the other half uh, divide it by uh, sixteen, and then that's going to be your fluid administration rate over the next sixteen hours. So pretty straightforward. So what are the complications from smoke inhalation? Well, first off, there uh, the some of the things that can be deadly are exposure to cyanide and carbon dioxide. Those can be acutely deadly, and indeed, that's what a lot of patients die of if they don't die from the burns. If they die in a, in a burning building, they die from exposure to cyanide or carbon dioxide. You're going to need to test the patients for cyanide and carbon dioxide while they're in the hospital, while they're in the ED, uh, particularly carbon dioxide because that can give you a false positive on your oxygenation and you can test them for cyanide after they've been admitted there are kits for that usually you don't do that in the ED though but both of those you have to test uh, for complications from ther thermal injury will generally result in the first 24 hours the primary concern is respiratory failure uh, of uh, damage to the uh, to the pulmonary tree so uh, if the patient hasn't already been intubated you should be monitoring their oxygenation very very closely and if that oxygenation starts to drop um, if they start to show signs of respiratory dis distress then you need to intubate them complications from the chemical injuries which surround the parenchyma will manifest over uh, the first week. So most of these patients are going to be admitted to, admitted to the hospital for at least a week because these complications, there's really no way of determining whether or not they're going to happen. So chemical injury complications inc include uh, bronchoalveolar edema, pulmonary superinfection, and ARDS. And then long-term complications, and this is after the patient's been discharged, if they do survive smoke inhalation, they can develop idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, and that's just because of the uh, significant amount of inflammation that occurs throughout the parenchyma that can put them at risk for IPF. So once you've admitted the patient, First off, with treatment, as mentioned, you're going to continue supplemental oxygen for at least two days, and you want to continue monitoring those saturation levels either by pulse ox or by ABGs, and endotracheal intubation is usually going to be necessary, and we perform this uh, in conjunction with positive and expiratory pressure. There are various uh, ways we can administer this oxygen. Usually it's done by 100% oxygen. You can also use Heliox. Heliox is a helium oxygen compound, and that helps get the... Uh, it, helium has a, a, a smaller weight than oxygen, so that allows to, uh, us to get the oxygen, to deliver the oxygen deeper into the pulmonary tree and uh, provide more oxygenation. So either of those are okay. Gradually, we want to step the patient down level. So if they're endotracheally intubated with PEEP, we want to try to step them down just to general endotracheal intubation. From there to mask, in, into, uh, mask inhalation, and then from there to nasal cannula. Uh, so we're trying to wean them off the supplemental oxygen, but you can't wean them off too quickly. So the only time you can wean the patient off is if they are above 90%. Then you can start that process. Inhaled bronchodilators are useful in non-intubated patients, particularly in any smoke inhalation patients that have COPD because they already have obstructive disease that inhaled bronchodilators that they already take are going to be even more necessary. Endotracheal suction serves a purpose in smoke inhalation because there may be particles, so you can use that if particularly on the chest x-ray you see anything, uh, but there's pretty limited use for uh, endotracheal suction in smoke inhalation, particularly if it's uh, pure smoke. 
Pulmonary toilet incentive spirometry is good because uh, generally the patients who are uh, who are have been intubated for a long period of time, uh, once they get extubated, they are going to need to be uh, they, they need to be ventilating the lower parts of their lungs, and so incentive spirometry is going to help with that. And then opiate pain medications are generally prescribed to all patients with burns. You need to use this judiciously if the patient's not intubated because remember opiate pain medications do decrease the respiratory drive. Okay, so gastric aspiration. So gastric aspiration sounds kind of benign and it can be. I mean, a lot of people with, uh, with GERD sometimes aspirate a little bit and that can be relatively benign, but at the same end, uh, gastric aspiration can also be catastrophic, depending on the amount. So, um, you know, maybe while you're vomiting, you might get, oh, just a, a couple milliliters of, of, of stomach content into your lungs. And you know how that may hurt. Well, patients with severe gastric aspiration, it's not just a couple milliliters, it's, it's several milliliters to deciliters. So this is the aspiration of gastric contents. Usually it's due to vomiting, particularly if the patient has a decreased level of consciousness. So if you're vomiting just due to being sick and you're throwing up in the toilet, that's not going to cause gastric aspiration to a, a great degree. However, if you're drunk or sedated, uh, then you, could, uh, you can vomit, but you don't wake up. And if you're lying on your back, you're going to aspirate most of that. Some gastric aspiration cases occur nosocomially, and that is particularly why we tell patients that they have to be NPO for 24 hours before they get surgery, because the anesthesia we give during surgery can cause gastric aspiration. It can cause vomiting. And then severe GERD can cause gastric aspiration too, but it's going to have to be pretty severe. The clinical symptoms of gastric aspiration may not be noted immediately or in the hours following the aspiration event. So uh, the, uh, what we're going to see here is two things. Just like in, uh, just like in, the, uh, in smoke inhalation, you have chemical injury and you have thermal injury. In gastric aspiration, you have chemical injury and you've got uh, potential bacterial injury. So the chemical injury happens due to the hydrochloric acid. So you're, you're choking up acid into your lungs. That's going to cause damage to your parenchyma. And so due to that damage, you're going to have cough, wheezing, tachypnea, ultimately fever, and possibly respiratory depress, uh, distress. The cough, wheezing, tachypnea tend to show up rather quickly if it's a severe enough aspiration because you're getting that chemical injury right away. Now, the other symptoms that may show up later on uh, include fever and respiratory dis distress. The cough, wheezing, and tach tachypnea can get worse, but the fever and respiratory distress tend to happen later. And why does that happen? Well, when you have the chemical injury, you do incite an inflammatory response, which can result in fever, and also you can have a complication of developing pneumonia from, your, uh, from, from the aspiration because you do have bacteria in your stomach and so that can result in colonization of the lungs. So there are a range of symptoms. Certainly the symptoms that a patient has immediately after the event is not necessarily as bad as it's going to get. So these patients are going to need admission and they're going to need uh, uh, close observation. What do we do for the initial management? First off, we need to give these patients supplemental oxygen to maintain 90%. Here we're not so much concerned, I mean, we're always concerned about the airway, but we're not so much concerned about obstruction and edema surrounding the airway like we are where there's the thermal injury. So generally, patients with gastric aspiration don't need to be intubated like the patients with smoke inhalation. Usually a uh, nasal cannula or mask ventilation is going to be enough to keep the patients above 90%, but never say never. IV fluids are going to be really important as well because uh, there can be damage uh, 
chemical damage to the uh, to the bronchial tree and to the uh, alveoli and their uh, interface with the capillaries. A baseline chest x-ray is going to be important. You're not going to see a lot of damage immediately after the aspiration event, but it's going to be important because uh, if the patient starts to develop certain symptoms, then you want to have something to compare to. And then routine laboratories. A lot of times on your routine labs, on your CBC, you will see a leukocytosis, and that's due to the, uh, to the, um, the chemical injury causing inf inflammation. So just because you see leukocytosis on the CBC, it doesn't mean the patient has an infection. That can be just due to the injury and the inflammation from the chemical. Uh, oral pharyngeal suctioning may be performed. Uh, you don't need to be aware of that too much for the USMLE, but uh, patients who have vomited uh, large amounts, sometimes they, uh, they may need oral pharyngeal suctioning. And then admission to the appropriate unit, that unit is usually going to be the ICU. For inpatient management, primarily what we're observing for are complications, uh, which are aspiration pneumonia. There are lots of different complications for gastric aspiration, but aspiration pneumonia is the most common. It develops in about 25% of patients. So I just want to clear this out here, the difference between these two terms, aspiration pneumonitis and aspiration pneumonia. Aspiration pneumonitis is a, the term for the chemical injury to the lung. So you're breathing in gastric acid, and that causes uh, inflammation of the lung parenchyma. And so you have pneumonitis, literally lung inflammation. That's different from aspiration pneumonia, which is a bacterial infection due to the aspiration. For aspiration pneumonia, the symptoms are similar to community-acquired pneumonia. It really is pneumonia. It's just due to a different cause. It's not due to, uh, it's not due to uh, strep. It's due to aspiring E. coli or aspiring uh, some other uh, gram-negative rod. So the symptoms that show up are going to be pretty similar to any other pneumonia. Dyspnea, productive cough, fever, tachycardia, and so forth. Now the difficulty in diagnosing aspiration pneumonia is that the patient already usually has dyspnea, mm -hmm. productive cough, fever, and tachycardia. So how do we know if the patient has a, a aspiration pneumonia versus just simply uh, aspiration pneumonitis. And the way we can tell this uh, are if the patient has a worsening in, uh, in uh, their status. So if they're improving and then after two to three days they suddenly start worsening, that's a sign of aspiration pneumonia. If a patient has a white cell count that's declining but then it suddenly starts going back up, that's a sign of aspiration pneumonitis. So usually aspiration pneumonitis occurs around two to three days after the aspiration. So you should start to see an improvement in the patient's status, at least a minor improvement in the patient's status, and then uh, you'll see a, a worsening. So the things that you're going to do if you suspect aspiration pneumonia first is going to be to get a sputum culture because that's going to be the most helpful as far as making a definitive diagnosis. Secondly, you're going to want to get a chest x-ray. That's going to be uh, the... Uh, well, that's going to be your first step, actually. So you're going to want to get a chest x-ray because chest x-ray is always the best initial step in making the diagnosis of pneumonia. So chest x-ray is uh, the best initial step. Sputum culture will be the most accurate test. And then as far as treatment, there are many choices. You're going to want to cover a very wide spectrum. So you're covering gram-positives, gram-negatives, anaerobes, and if the patient happened to develop the pneumonia while they were in the hospital, like any non-community acquired pneumonia, uh, you're going to need to give them some kind of medication that covers MRSA. So septriaxone plus uh, either a macrolide or fluoroquinolone 
can be useful on an outpatient basis. If the patient had aspiration, you discharge them, and now they come back with signs consistent with pneumonia, that can be, uh, that can be used. If they are an inpatient, you should give them piperacillin tazobactam or uh, and vancomycin. The piperacillin tazobactam is a very, very, very good uh, wide-spectrum drug. Vancomycin covers MRSA. So those are the combinations I would use. Certainly, there are a lot of acceptable answers. Just make sure you're covering gram positives, gram negatives. Uh, anaerobes uh, and definitely those gram-negative rods and then if they're if they develop this while they're hospitalized you have to make sure and cover MRSA. Some of the complications resulting from gastric aspiration include adult respiratory distress syndrome which we'll talk about in a different section, aspiration pneumonia which we already talked about, bacteremia and septic shock, pulmonary abscess which you would see on chest x-ray, empyema uh, which is a localized uh, abscess in a an already existing uh, an already existing cavity, and then bronchopleural fistula. That's quite rare. So these bottom three things here are the domain of surgery. So they'll be addressed at a different time.